What's up guys and girls, welcome to Free Dive Passion. Today I'm gonna give you a little bit of, bit of an update on how my training's been going. So we've been really lucky in Dahab during this whole coronavirus thing and, and lockdown. We've still been able to get into the water. Now, like I've mentioned before, Blue Hole is being closed. And Blue Hole's amazing because no matter what the conditions are like, no matter how much wind and waves there are, the Blue Hole is protected by a reef. So by the time the, the waves get into Blue Hole, they're, they're small enough for it to not bother your training too badly. And we never get current inside Blue Hole. Blue Hole's been closed this whole time, so we could only dive in Lighthouse Bay. In Lighthouse Bay, on a typical day, you can get 35 to 40 meters um, with reasonable conditions. It's definitely not calm, <laughs> but you can dive, you can get some training done. Now, if we want more than that, we've been either kayaking out when I was doing shallower depths, and now I'm um, knocking on the door of 90, so we've been taking boats out. Now, the problem with boats is, and the kayak, is we can only do it on calm days. We can only do it when the wind is almost non-existent, like around five knots. Otherwise, the boat drags the mooring, and we experience like a sort of artificial current, or there's like real current. So, Dahab is pretty much famous for its wind. The town is full of wind surfers and kite surfers because we have wind like <laughs> nine days out of 10. So what that means for me is I only get to deep dive once every 10 days or so, which of course is, is, is not ideal. And it's kind of frustrating when you look at the wind forecast and you see like the next week, it's gonna be windy every day. Normally when we do get a window with less wind, then it's like we get this two hour period in the afternoon. So we have to do like afternoon diving rather than morning diving. And we just need to take that day and, and that's the day that we can do our deep diving. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating now that I'm reaching my P PB depths because I feel like so good, I feel so strong. And I just want to like, just do it, just do my dives and start um, approaching a hundred or just at least getting some like nice work done. But you know, you've got to like face reality and adapt to reality and accept reality basically. So what I'll do is if I've got five days or more until my next deep dive, then I'll do some like strength training, like a good hard workout. So I'm not detraining because, you know, normally you would peak over two or three weeks. But now because of this whole situation, I'm peaking over like three months. And in those three months, I might only get, you know, 10 to 15 dives. So all the base training that I did, if I just totally cut that out the way you would normally when you peak, it would have been like, by the time I do my deepest dive, it would have all disappeared. So kind of like the nice thing about only being able to dive like every 10 days or a week is that I can kind of like maintain my strength, maintain my conditioning. So I'm always feeling fit and strong for my, my deep dives. One interesting thing has happened to me over the past month, which I would like to share, and that's when I was uh, approaching 90, I did an 88 meter dive and I came back up to the surface and I could feel the beginnings of hypoxia. Now it's very useful to do hypoxic training and to know how it feels to be hypoxic, even go into an LMC because then you can realize something's not right. So I felt this, nobody could see it. It wasn't so obvious. I wasn't having a strong LMC, but I could feel I was hypoxic and I knew I shouldn't be because I'm, I feel like I'm ready to do much more. Um, so I repeated the dive again, 88, and I felt the same amount of hypoxia. So then I knew something was up. It wasn't just a freak on that day. I needed to make some sort of change. So I kind of like had to think pretty hard myself about what was going on. I spoke to Gus Cravenas. Um, he's a really experienced freediver. He's done over 100 himself. 
and I, I like to bounce ideas off him quite regularly. And we kind of came to the conclusion that I was diving too slow. So in the past, I've always been quite a fast, constant weight diver. But if I was honest with myself, a part of the reason I was going fast is because I didn't trust my technique, I didn't trust the fin, and I didn't trust my apnea. So I went fast because I felt like I had to go fast. So this period of training, I wanted to get over that, and I was intentionally going slower than what I normally would. So I was doing more like a, a meter per second sort of um, dive time. So I dropped my depth back, and I went back and did 82, but on my ascent, I focused on like a faster, stronger fin and technique. The dive felt great. That's how I feel much more comfortable to dive. Um, so, all in all, it felt very positive. Then my next dive, I did 85. Again, I felt very strong. Dive time was less. CO2 was even less. The dive felt really good. And then I repeated 88. And again, that time, no hypoxia, nothing. Everything went really, really well. So, because I had two dives using one style, and it had the same outcome, this slight beginning of hypoxia, and then I changed this one aspect, and now I can do the dive with no hypoxia, then it's pretty easy to, to conclude that increasing my speed is what's helped. Now, just the fact that it's helped is great, but as a coach, I always try and understand like, why something happens, like what is the, the reasons for, for things to go this way. And, you know, of course, we can only have theories, but my best theories are one thing is that going faster allows me to use better technique. When I think back to my dives, when I was intentionally trying to go slow and very relaxed and very gentle, then I wasn't really using as good a technique as what I could do. If I use good technique, you just go fast automatically by default. So I think better technique means more efficiency, even though I'm going faster. I think the second reason may be, and this is pure theory, but that's all we have in freediving, is that perhaps going faster and using closer to your sprint speed means you're going to be using type two muscle fibers. And type two muscle fibers don't use oxygen, they're purely anaerobic. Now, because of peripheral vasoconstriction and the fact that you should have a limited amount of blood in the legs, means theoretically you should kind of switch over to type 2 muscle fibers anyway, the same as like the theory behind katsu training. But what I'm thinking is maybe that there's some sort of gray area, like really soft, gentle kicking, even though you might not have that much um, red blood cells and oxygen carriers in the, in the legs, maybe that means that you're still using a more anaerobic predominant muscle than if you went for more of a strong sprint style swim. So this is something that I'm going to continue to think about and maybe try and figure out some ways to, to test it with myself and with other people. And I like to share it with you because this is the reason why I continue to train. Each training cycle, I might have one or two little realizations. And these things you can't read in a book. You can't just get told them. The only way to, to really have these higher levels of realizations is to, to do the training and, and see what works and see what doesn't work. So that's where I'm at now. Um, tomorrow, it's going to be a calm day. So at 2 o'clock. A few of us should get to go out and, um, and do some diving. I'm going to do 90. Maybe I'll try and bring a camera and show you guys what's going on. Until next time, take it easy and dive safe.